It's nice to see you again. I hope you had a few fun weeks with Burke and Lucy. And a bit of time off was the week ago when we were traveling in the States. Today, I am going to go to two or even three things. Um, the main topic for today is drug discovery and docking, which is a concept that's not really covered in the book at all. There are lots of things that have happened here. I'm going to start, though, with doing a bit of recap of the folding, because Lucy told me she didn't have time to go through all the details about folding units and uh, some of the stuff on cold denaturation last week. So I will cover that a bit in particular because originally I had a few slides about G protein coupled receptors here, but I know that Lucy already covered that in the membrane protein lecture. So I think we should be fine on the balance of time. And that also provides a good way to reconnect with last week. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about docking and the entire drug discovery pipeline in practice. And at the end, I think I'll have a chance to share some of the very cool stuff that has happened recently with the coronavirus. But I will get started in talking about folding in general. So I think Lucy told you a little bit about Christian Amfinsen and his result, and I know I've covered this before. And it's one, and I know that I told you, but I need to remind you that it's one of those results that seems so completely obvious in hindsight, that proteins, just throw it in a glass of water uh, or a test tube, and proteins, you can denaturate them with high temperature, salt concentration or something or pH, and if you reverse these conditions, then the proteins should spontaneously refold. Should is the key word. There are some examples here that it's difficult to unboil an egg, but small proteins in general will be able to refold. This was so not obvious in the uh, 1940s and 50s, and that's of course the reason why Christian Amfinsen eventually got the Nobel Prize for this. But today we take it for granted, and it's one of those things we don't even talk about it in the course literature because duh, it's obvious. But the nature of this transition is not obvious. Uh, and we started by covering this already at the very beginning of the course when we talked about all these transitions and we made the parallel to phase transitions where there's gradual uh, all versus non-transitions and then we spent several lectures on that. I'm not gonna go through all that again. But in the case of folding, there are two things that are important. First, the extent to which semi-folded states exist. And we talked a little bit about folding intermediates earlier in the class. And the other part is that, what is it really that folds? Do you start, do you fold one protein or do you fold part of a protein or do you even need several molecules together for them to be able to fold? And we're gonna go through one example today that really helps us understand what is it that folds in a way that I find kind of beautiful. There are many ways to measure this and the challenge here that we somehow wanna measure how much energy or Ideally, I would like to see the movie in practice as what is it folding. Apart from computer simulations, which are models, uh, we can't really do that, though we're gonna need to access the SID directly. And the classical experiment that you would do in a physics lab here is calorimetry. And calorimetry is a really simple technique, just measure the amount of heat we're putting into a system. The slight complication there is that the amount of heat we need to put in to fold proteins is very limited so that you need a very good insulation and you need to be able to measure very precisely exactly what was the change in well, temperature, specific heat and how much energy we need to use for it. And the way you typically determine protein folding or unfolding in this case is that as we're adding heat here and as the temperature goes up, eventually you see some sort of jump in the heat capacity here and then when we get down, back down here, the heat capacity has changed. So there is some sort of offset. So a change in heat capacity is usually a very strong indication that there's been a phase transition or something. Uh, it's also, it's not really abrupt in the sense that it occurs over instantly, I'd say, it, it, well, compared to exact 100 degrees of boiling. But that was related to the things we also brought up in phase transitions, right? That on a microscopic scale, when we're looking at individual molecules, it's reasonable that this change actually happens over a limited temperature span, a few tens of degrees. So what this tells us is that there is some sort of abrupt change. There is nothing that happens down here, and then there is some sort of temperature interval over which something happens. And in this case, it's the protein unfolding. But the mere fact that this happens at a particular temperature, does it, that doesn't really tell us anything about the cooperativity or anything. It doesn't tell us whether it's part of the protein unfolding, one folding unit, uh, or if you need 10 proteins together. It just means that it happens fastest at temperature. So we're not really that much wiser just from looking at this plot. Uh, 
But then people have thought about this, um, and they thought lots about it. So based on this, if you know how much protein there is in this particular test tube, and we know how much energy we're putting in, well, then we know what is the folding or melting energy. That's the same thing, different signs per unit of protein, per molecule, right? Because we can count the molecules. And then we're going to need to find some sort of way to measure how much is the energy per melting unit or per folding unit. We don't know that yet, but assuming that we had such a method, then we could start to compare that if the amount of energy, sorry, if the amount of energy per melting unit is the same thing as one whole protein, which we get from the previous plot, then it's an all or none in the sense that you need one protein molecule at the time folding. If the melting energy or the energy per folding unit is less than the fold protein, that means that the folding happens as part of the protein. And in theory, if the energy per melting or folding unit is larger than the full protein, then we need an aggregate of many. The problem is that it's not at all trivial to find out what the energy is per melting unit. So I'm going to take you through a smart trick in terms of equations that helps us get that. And it's also one I'm going to, there is no solution for me but to show you this and how this is derived. But again, this is not obvious. And if I had not thought about this, I would not be able to spontaneously come up with it. I would rather waste 10 hours of trial and error on paper first. So we're going to need to talk, think a little bit about energy and entropy, both in the native states and the molten states. And that goes back to the thing that I tried to hammer in in the early parts of the classes. Any time you get a question about a process or you need to think about a change, you need to separate before and after. Don't start to think that, oh, the free energy is high or the free energy is low. It's always a matter of what is it in state A relative to state B. So here we call the native state E and S and the molten state then uh, we just add a prime. And that means that we can define the free energy in each of these states. And well, if we simplify this and say that there are only two states, there is a full native state and there is a molten state, then I can write out the partition function because the partition function only consists of two. So there's one that is the one without prime and then there's one with prime, right? I like those type of partition functions. It's, almost, it's just as easy as it was for you in the lab. And this actually shows that as simple and horrible as lab one was, you don't necessarily need more than two states to start to capture interesting things. And then if I want to say, okay, so what is the likelihood, the fraction that should be in the molten state? Well, that should be the free energy of the molten state divided by that sum, right? And then I can simplify this a bit by taking E prime minus E, and then all these turns out into one divided by one plus, and then the change. So I'm just dividing everywhere by that expression. Do you follow that, even if you didn't derive it yourselves? So it's just, Basically, I've, I've just written out the probability of being in the molten state for a molecule. And the key thing here, for a molecule. Because this should be the melting unit or so. Then, you've also seen some of, there is some sort of energy as a function of a regime. There is some sort of regime here where things happen. And that's what we can measure, that's what we can see in this calorimetry. There will be some range over, energy, or sorry, over temperature when the folding happens. And the exact shape of this curve is super difficult. But the cool thing, this happens over a very relatively narrow regime. So when we're starting here, we have not molten the molecule at all. And when we finish, the entire molecule is molten. So the first approximation that we can say, well, the entire molecule, everything melts, so that the fraction in molten goes from zero to one. And that's the entire temperature span over which the folding happens. So it's just the simplest possible approximation of the derivative here. Everything changes roughly over the temperature range I have. And you can argue that it's horrible, but I'm interested in first order approximations here. Um, that's sadly, an art that is lost because you have so many computers and calculators and everything that don't start doing things advanced. Do it with paper and pen. But we also know, so this is something that I can calculate from that graph I had, but we also have an expression for P molten on the previous slide, right? So what you can do, we can calculate this derivative too from that long expression I had. So now, and that should be the derivative of the long expression. And if you know your uh, exponential laws and derivatives there, that will 
fall out to be this expression. Either you do it yourself or you just trust me that that's the expression. It's just derivative of logarithms with respect to temperature. And then this small term falls out due to the chain rules and the derivatives inside the exponent. And if you don't like long equations, you can actually simplify that and say that's roughly p molten multiplied by one minus p molten, and that takes a term. Actually, it's not even an approximation. So that expression should then be equal to this one that we're reading from the plot. But the key thing, this is what we're measuring per unit, and this is what, uh, sorry, that one we're measuring from uh, the amount of protein we have, and this one we're measuring per melting unit. And then, in theory, if you had a computer, you could put in everything now, but again, let's do this without computers. We know exactly in the middle where things are folding. If you don't know more than I do, let's assume that 50% of the protein is molten there. So then P molten is 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.5. Everything becomes really simple. So, and then, that means that that derivative is roughly 0 0.25 multiplied by a term that involves the energy and then kT. And then we say that that has to be equal by 1 over delta T. And that means that we can calculate how much, what is the energy, melting energy per molecule, and then we also know the melting energy per unit, uh, sorry, melting energy per folding unit and melting energy per molecule. And then we have those two things, and then we can compare them. And let's see if I had a, no, I don't have it. And the point is when we do this for, it's not universally true, but it is true to 99% of the time that for virtually all proteins, the melting unit is, if it's a small protein, it's the entire molecule. But in other cases, it tends to be the domain. Did Lucy talk to you about domains in bioinformatics? So for small proteins like Christian Amfinsen's uh, Luciferase or so, if it's a protein up to 100 residues or so, there is just one domain. For very large proteins, say like a ribosome or something, that could be 50 or 60 chains. So that genes evolve, proteins evolve by genes sticking together multiple of these domains. And domains are partly the part that evolution evolves. So evolution does not work in the fact that changing one amino acid at the time. That too happens, but it's a relatively small component. Evolution mostly happens that one gene borrows an entire, a part of another gene and takes an entire domain. And a good example might be, you might have a channel, that hopefully Lucy talks about ion channels. You might have a channel that is pH regulated in a bacterium. It's a very simple channel. In your nervous system, you have almost exactly the same channel, but then you have an extra domain, so that is voltage gated. But the channel is the same. It's just nature has, you stole a domain that is sensitive to voltage. Many of the things that work in your eye, say the rhodopsin molecules, it's the same thing there, that you don't evolve a function, but you steal function from another gene. And whether that's a freak of, it's not a freak of nature and it's not a coincidence, but the point is that these domains are virtually always the folding units too. So a large protein with 1,500 residues, it does not work, it does not fold by 1,500 amino acids, boom, collapsing together and folding. They work by multiple small pieces on this long jarn or thread. They fold independently, the first approximation, and then these small components fold large aggregates. And the reason we've been able to find that out is exactly because we were able to compare what is the energy per melting unit and the energy per molecule. The beautiful part of that to me, I think it reconciles on the one hand physics and on the other hand, say bioinformatics and evolution. And that's a key concept that Bioinformatics does not work because you're using the laws of physics. Bioinformatics works by cheating. You, you're basically looking, no, but literally, you're looking at proteins, and bioinformatics works because proteins are evolutionary related. And it's interesting because today, everything with big data is very popular, right? And there are some concepts that, surprisingly, they actually do work, that people are, because how successful bioinformatics has been in the life scientists, scientists are using deep learning to, for instance, predict properties of material based on the properties of another material. And in theory, this sounds great. You should just assemble a gigantic database of all the materials, and then you should be able to predict all the properties. But the problem is that silver is not evolutionary related to gold, right? So in some cases, it works. 
but biology has this very peculiar thing that all genes are related to that. It might be so far away and it might be so distantly related that you can't say it, but in principle we are all related. While on the other hand, everything we've gone through in this course is based on physics, that the fact that uh, with pro whether proteins fold is determined by pure laws of physics. And they're kind of two sides of the same coin, right? That the physics is certainly true, while the bioinformatics is frequently a more efficient way to get to the answer. But we need the physics to explain why it happens. So if we, the other part that I, that Lucy might have skipped over a bit is to look a little bit, why do proteins unfold or melt or denaturate? There are many words. Um, and the only way to understand this is again, go back to this, and you've probably heard it a few times now, but this is the one equation that you can't forget, E minus TS. And in particular, don't forget the deltas. So there is a before and there is an after. So if you denaturate, well, the order of the arrow here is important. Denaturate means that we go from folded to unfolded. And one way to do that is frequently to increase temperature or so. Uh, and this is partly based on the hydrophobic effect. Uh, this delta E will increase when temperature go up, uh, while delta S will be positive when we unfold. It's better, the protein will be more disordered when we're unfolding it, right? So that makes sense to understand it. But then there is this complication that S will also drop with temperature. So if you just look at that equation, what we expect is that at some point, if you boil a protein, they will certainly unfold. But at some point, if the temperature becomes low enough, the S part should start to go in the opposite direction. So what this equation is basically saying that if you just drop the temperature far enough, proteins should also unfold at very low temperature. So there should be a, temp a narrow regime. Is that true? It happens all the time, right? When you go out and it's freezing. Well, not this winter, that and your proteins will denaturate. And we take an egg and you freeze it. It ends up being boiled when you freeze the egg. Well, you can certainly get cold damage, but cold damage is usually slightly different. The cold damage occurs when, when the water in cells freeze and that tends to explode the cell walls or something. So that's a slightly different property. Uh, but the cool thing is that there is cold denaturation of proteins. So when I was roughly your age, this was super cutting edge and it was just the first few cases where people had been able to identify it. So basically you need to separate all the polar versus non-polar interactions. Forget about the top on the left, right? Um, but the point is that there are cases where we've been able to see cold denaturation in experiments. Um, and the way you do it is primarily you try to measure the stabilization energy and in many cases, you actually, you don't, you might not see that it becomes so bad that it's going all the way to actually unfolding, but you can see that the stabilization energy of the protein is smaller and smaller and smaller. And just by extrapolating, you can start to say that, well, if this were to continue, actually, this might be a better way of showing it. So all these proteins at zero, they have not unfolded yet, but if you just see, so here they would denaturate due to high temperature between 65 to 90 degrees. This regime, they're stable in, but just based on myoglobin, for instance, the green curve, you can probably see where that is going, right? So just based on those curves, you would expect that at some point here, they should become unstable again at minus 30, 40 degrees. So why didn't they just continue that curve to the left? That's a bit stupid. They should have done that when they published the paper. Yes? Yes, proteins need to be in water. And what happens at zero degrees centigrade, right? The water freezes and absolutely nothing happens because then the water molecules stop moving. And at that point, the protein will not denaturate anymore. So the reason why we're not really seeing this is that something else, you have a phase transition in water, actual phase transition in water first. So that's why it's not really that important. On the other hand, there are cases where water is colder than zero degrees. For instance, if you have a high salt concentration, right? So in the water, say, outside Antarctica or something, you can certainly have water that's minus five to minus, well, minus five, six degrees centigrade, simply because you have salt. So what if you're a fish living in the Antarctic? So it turns out that 
quite a few organisms have what you call cold shock proteins. Um, so these are protein structures that have been evolved, that have evolved specifically. They're similar to other, but they have evolved to be stable at low temperatures. And in some cases, if there is a particularly cold environment, the organisms will even start to express more of these proteins to pretty much protect their cells and everything. Um, it's essentially an antifreeze protein. Uh, so they have evolved different amino acid patterns that are simply stable at lower temperature than in your cells. It also depends a bit on an animal, right? That you're warm-blooded, so your blood is always around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you're a fish swimming in water, there is no way you can maintain the blood to be at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that organism will have to adapt so that the blood can be at minus 5 degrees centigrade. I think that's all I had from last week, uh, and I'm going to continue to the next part, which is really fun, because now we're going to start applying everything we learned. There's a bunch of physics here. There's going to be a bunch of horrible trial and error and sweeping things under the rug, because now we need to make things work in practice. But this has become super interesting with the coronavirus. So drug design is a very large process. And in particular, lots of this occurs in the hospital and everything. And I won't go into too much detail there. But I'm going to cover a little bit how we use all the tools that you have learned in drug design. Uh, in general, you're going to need to start with the bioinformatics part. And I'll come back to this at the end. Uh, but for, for now, I'm going to skip over the bioinformatics just a little bit. So assuming that you have some sort of model of the protein that we would like to target, then you can definitely use all the physics-based tools that you have uh, to first build all the side chains and everything. You can energy minimize it. You can simulate these models. And at some point, you would like to use free energy methods to calculate what is binding here. And can you get something to bind to change how this protein works. And that's pretty much how all drugs work. You need something small to bind to change how the protein works. Um, we're a bit simple that way. We haven't gotten much further. But what we would like, you've probably all seen how slow simulations are. In many cases, you're going to be, you have no idea how many drugs there are. Um, the space, the chemical space is roughly 10 to the power of 60 or so. There's virtually an infinite amount of potential drugs. So you can't test each possible drug in a simulation. So we're going to need to find some sort of sloppy way to rapidly test things that might be interesting. Uh, and this is where we're sweeping things under the rug. But our rug is a large one, so we have lots of room to sweep things under. What these drugs will in general do, that there is some sort of target protein that's red here. And that's, there will be some sort of pocket. Exactly how this looks will depend. And then there is a drug that we hope binds. And when this drug binds, there should be a biological response. And this biological response could also mean that the red protein no longer, say, transports ions or something. Something should happen. And one of the reasons why these pockets are much more common than we think is that this is also how nature regulates proteins and signaling in general. Things bind. So it's, the pockets are already there. We just need to find new ways to interact with them. So here are some examples. Uh, up on the left, you see a. Uh, pocket in a globular protein, so it's a very deep pocket, and it's also hydrophobic. And then you have a blue molecule that binds virtually perfectly. This is a bit more complicated pocket, just on the surface of a protein, where you have a small uh, molecule here binding. And this, I certainly wouldn't have guessed it, but the computer is smarter than I am. And in general, you might have very large uh, receptors or something on the surface of cell, and then it's just a matter of finding what is the exact property of your binding on the surface. Your body uses this all the time, too. Your immune system, an antibody. An antibody recognizes certain antigens. And an antigen is just a fancy way. Say, if, when you're getting immunized for the flu, the immunization just consists of we are injecting small pieces of the virus in your, in your body. And then your body will express antibodies uh, to identify those pieces. And then those pieces will be essentially be transported out. But now you have antibodies in your cells that recognize the uh, uh, parts of the protein related to the influenza virus. And when you actually get the influenza virus, now you already have antibodies. And that means that your immune system can fight it. But this is our way of trying to invoke the same response. You would imagine that scientists have been really creative here, right? And we've identified things that hit virtually every single protein in your body, all types of diseases. And then you're incorrect, because we're not really that creative. Um, the entire blue quadrant up there is G protein coupled receptors. So one quarter of all the drugs known, actually one quarter of all the drugs that we sell just target G protein coupled receptors. 
so that if you if you ever get a if you ever have to make a bet what a drug hits, say deep protein coupled receptor, and it's like 27% chance that you're going to be right. The these are nuclear receptors, and then we have ligand-gated ion channels and voltage-gated ion channels. Uh, so there's pretty much four classes of membrane proteins that corresponds to 50% of all known drugs. Now here, these are entire classes of proteins. There's more than one protein there. But, and then you see and then there's a very long tail of very small components. Some of the cancer targets are up there. If we could get better at identifying new classes of structures and finding new things to find, there is a remarkable, there is a gold mine here of new things that we could use to fight disease. Uh, it's not at all that these are the only ones that worked. These were just the ones that we got started with. There are a couple of things you're going to need to know, and these are typical things that people, nasty teachers, love to ask about at exams. Um, there are a few ways drugs can interact with a molecule. So by far, a small drug, we don't, there are we, we call these drugs many things. A drug is really something that is sold on the market and particularly used for treatment. So we actually give it to patients. And I frequently, we frequently say drug design and everything. That's because we are trying to design something that could become a drug in the future. But we need other names for things for, that just bind. So any small chemical molecule, we frequently call them compound, just to make sure that, just to tell it, well, technically a protein is also a molecule, right? But to say, stress that we're talking about the small molecules here, that's what we occasionally call them compound. But then we like names. Um, so any, occasionally we call them ligand too. Ligand is something small that binds to something large and starts a response or something. So compound or ligand or drug, it's really the same thing. And then I'm going to introduce a fourth name. Sorry about this. <laughs> if this was me, I would have used one name, uh, but I didn't choose it. So in particular, in the cases where you have a receptor and you have a small ligand that should bind and create a response. And this could, for instance, be to create a nerve signal or something. These ligands are typically called agonists. Um, and an agonist could be, say a signal should bind to a G-protein coupled receptor and starts a, uh, well, a signaling in the protein or something. Uh, a full agonist is something that activates the protein and it activates it to 100%, as you would expect that it should. The normal agonist in your body, that's typically a normal agonist. You could Imagine designing an agonist. There are cases that I might want to activate the receptor the same way your body does. So maybe I can design another small molecule that has the same property. My molecule will also be an agonist. So it will also, it will turn the key and start the receptor and it will start it fully. Occasionally though, I only get a partial agonist. A par think of a partial agonist that it starts the car but only to 50%. Sometimes that's good um, because sometimes I just sometimes I might not want the full response. I just want to evoke a little bit of the response, or it might be that it's not that good yet. Uh, I would like to have a full agonist, but I I haven't been able to design one yet. But it gets you part of the signal. You can have a neutral. You can have something called an antagonist. An antagonist is really is fairly simple. This is a binding site. So think about taking a piece of chewing gum and stocking it, putting it in the lock. That will prevent you from putting a key there, right? So you can't open the door anymore. And an antagonist is just a small molecule. It binds in the same place, but it does not activate the protein. But now my molecule is bound there. So when your actual correct molecule comes, you can't bind there because there is chewing gum in the lock. If I want to turn off a receptor, that's what you want. So, an, and a whole lot of drugs in the world are antagonists. And we, we oh, okay, so if we call them that, they activate when we start the, pro, pro, the, uh, the process or the receptor. We typically talk about this as inhibited. So, we're inhibiting the response so there is no longer any response. So, one of the famous drugs in Sweden is LOSEC, pre -LOSEC, right? And that's a proton pump inhibitor. So, that it prevents us from pumping protons in your stomach. And occasionally, this is rarer, but it can happen that in some cases you might actually want to create the opposite response. And that's, that's what you call an inverse agonist. So an inverse agonist, it has an effect, but it has the opposite effect of the natural ligand. So understanding these differences between an agonist, a neutral antagonist, and an inverse agonist is important to be able to understand what people are speaking about when it comes to drug design.
And at this point, you might think that it's easy. We just need to design these small molecules. I'm going to come back to this in a second, but it turns out to be a nightmare in practice. That we definitely need a small compound or ligand or antagonist, or agonist, whatever we call it, that should bind to the target protein. Uh, and that is by far the easiest part that we're going to talk about today. But if you're working in a pharma company, the problem is not enough to bind to the protein. Any idiot can design something and tell me, trust me, I've done it. Uh, any idiot can define something that binds. You also need to make sure that it doesn't bind in other places. Uh, because if somebody were to go around and put chewing gum in every single lock of the building, the janitor might get a bit irritated. The other part is say, people tend to argue that uh, it's an advantage if you actually can get the compound to where it should be, say the brain. That's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, we all like to eat drugs, right? But you have a blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier serves to make sure that things don't go from your blood to the brain. Your entire stomach is based on denaturating proteins. It's pretty good at denaturating other molecules too. There is an easy way around this. You can inject. But again, if it's, if it's something that, say, whatever, that if you have, assuming that you wake up Monday morning with a headache, you don't want to have an injection because you have a bit of a headache, right? So that you want compounds that you can take orally. You would like this to be easy to get into the body. You would normally prefer not to have to eat 10 kilos on them per day. It's if nothing else because it's a bit heavy to carry. Uh, you want a slow and steady release of the drug. And then it's a huge advantage if you're not vomiting due to the side effects. And again, I'm not joking here, that if you have a serious form of cancer, you, sorry, you might have to accept those as a side effect of um, chemotherapy. But again, if you have a headache, you're not going to be happy vomiting while you get rid of the headache. So in practice, what's it called, what's it called, admetox, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity, this is actually frequently the largest bottlenecks for drug design. And you need to be aware of that, but we're not going to go into detail about it. Yes? So, um, I mean, a reason why, why this obviously doesn't work is that the bacteria are I don't know. Uh, I literally don't know. Um, now, of course, sure, the body, your body can produce 60 billion types of compounds, right? That would be complicated. So sure, the body tends to reuse compounds, and that's definitely part of it. I guess another part has to do with binding, that our proteins have not evolved to bind the drugs, because drugs were not part of evolution. So that the things that tend to bind, they tend to be small and hydrophobic compounds. They tend to be fairly rigid. And there is a reason for that. If they're not very rigid, if it's a long chain, then they would have a very good entropy if they are not bound. So to be able to bind, they need to be fairly small and rigid so they don't lose too much entropy when they bind. And simply chemicals, the, the, the fraction of small molecules that fulfill this, they tend to bind in very small places. Um, and that's, but that's probably the best explanation I can give. Um, it's a bit irritating. So there are... And if we're really going to go into hand-waving territory, there is something called Lipinski's rule of five. Uh, and the reason why there are five, that it's not that there are five parts to the rule, but in practice, things that tend to make good drugs is that they should weigh less than 500 Dalton. So they should be small enough to be transported everywhere in the blood. Log P should be less than five, and that has to do with the partition coefficient with octanol and water. And that means that if it's a very hydrophobic drug, you're not a very hydrophobic drug might be great at binding, but that's not going to help you if it can't be solvated in the blood and actually get there in the first place, right? You should have less than five hydrogen bond donors. Don't ask. It's just, <laughs> yeah, that, that usually works. <laughs> uh, and then we had two, well, it's almost five, but it's 10. So we multiply it by two. Less than 10 hydrogen bond acceptors. And that both of these hydrogen bond donors and accept the, well, the rest of the drug should be reasonably non-polar so that it can also cross membranes. So it can't be too hydrophobic and it can't be too hydrophilic. And then it should be small and rigid. Historically, this has kind of worked. The only problem is that it hasn't really led to a new drug in 20 years. And there are many reasons for this. One of the reasons is that we have much tougher regulatory requirements on drugs today. Aspirin would never have been approved today. It's far too dangerous. It's super dangerous because it can lead to bleeding and other things. Uh, 
but drugs that have been approved historically, we don't unapprove them. So the problem is that we're getting higher and higher requirement that we can't have side effects. Everything needs to be tested and everything. There are fewer and fewer drugs. It gets very expensive to develop new drugs. And of course, we start by picking the lower hanging fruit, right? That the easy ones we've already found. So having said that, there are, these are examples of four drugs. And you've probably never heard about these names, but so that the chemical names there is a chemical name and then there's a brand name. So Losec, for instance, that's called omeoprazole. Uh, omeoprazole is the actual chemical name, but depending on the market you're selling it, it's called, used to be called Nexium in the US, while it's called Losec, and that's, that's just PR and whatever brand they can protect. And here you see that there's these effects that they are small, they are typically fairly rigid with lots of uh, rings. Ring structures will be rigid. And then you can see that many of them target re various receptors here and then a couple of different uh, indications. So the ind indication is the word you use for what is, it, what is the reason for giving, administering this drug. So how did they find these drugs? Where do they come from? In principle, that could work. Uh, the problem is that chemical space is very large, right? And as I was about to say, divine inspiration is fine. And literally, it is fine. If you, if you come up with a drug tomorrow that would treat the coronavirus, I think people would be fairly happy. They're not going to start to ask, you, well, you need to be able to prove how you came up with it. If it cures the coronavirus, it cures the coronavirus. We're fairly happy if it doesn't have side effects. The problem is that divine inspiration, when you have 10 to the power of 60 alternatives, that you can't, we can't search randomly. Historically, this used to be fairly easy, that uh, we used to find things in uh, nature. Quite a few drugs have been found, for instance, the Amazons and everything, that there might have been a tribe that, well, cocaine is an example of this, right? That you're finding a substance, that you're chewing leaves, and that means that you get rid of the drowsiness, and then eventually you purify that, and in that case, it actually became a, a, a different type of drug. Uh, and what that usually then evolves is that you need to identify what is the active component. Um, because you start out with a leaf or something that has some sort of component, we don't know which one. And then you go through a process of isolating what is the specific molecule in this specific plant that has a component. But by the time you know that there is something in this leaf, it's fairly trivial to isolate what it is. Uh, then in many cases, these components are not particularly efficient. But again, then you have something that works and then you follow exactly the process that you said. Can we be smart? Can we optimize this a little bit and make it better? And occasionally you can. If you know where it binds and you know that, oh, there's a hydrogen bond donor here, but if I put the hydrogen bond acceptor on my molecule here, it would bind even better. And then if you're lucky, it does. So there's still a bit divine inspiration, but um, slightly more guided. The problem, though, is that here, too, this was easy for the low-hanging fruit, but as we, there are relatively few tribes that have identified plants that are good at curing, say, cervical cancer or something, right? That as we're getting into more advanced treatments, there are fewer things in nature that will work. So if you look at some sort of modern drug design, we don't just go out and look at things serendipitously, because in this case, for modern drug design, there might be a specific disease, for instance, coronavirus, that we would like to go after. And then we need preclinical. First, we need a bit of semi-divine inspiration. We need something to start with. And I'll come back to how we find this. And that's hopefully we have something that is at least a little bit of a clue. This might have a chance to bind. And then we need to go through and iterate this and try to improve. Can I get it to bind better? And the neat thing here is, of course, this we can, we can do some of these things in the computer while other things we do in the lab. If you have a great idea for 10 drugs that you think might work, I can go and test those 10 in the lab. I can't test 10 to the power of 3 in the lab, but I can test 10. And then you have to do first tests in the chemistry and eventually animal tests. And this is a process, this is actually fairly cheap. Uh, and this happen, predominantly happens in academia today. At, but at some point here, you realize you're super excited, and this is where people start to say they have developed a new drug for whatever, curing cancer. And that's when you see universities putting this on their homepage, saying that it's amazing, Group X has developed something to cure Y. It's nowhere near a real drug yet. This is a very early candidate. So what 
then you need to go through clinical testing. And then phase one, you need to test, is this safe for humans to take? And if humans die from your drug, it's likely not going to be a blockbuster. <laughs> even if it is safe for humans, literally, here we're, we're not even worried about whether it cures anything. We just want to make sure that people don't die or become seriously ill from taking this. If that is the case, the second, does it have any effect whatsoever on the disease in humans? There is a famous Twitter account that says, the title of the account is literally says in mice. Because again, that's what they said, that there is this, the classical thing is that the university will say that whatever, eating low, eating a high calorie diet will make sure that your sport performance improves. And then there's an illustration of somebody running. But then you actually read the paper, yes, that this was determined in mice. And I hate to break it to you, but you're not mice. So that quite a few of these things, it works in mice models, but not in humans. And there is another joke that some uh, colleague told that if you're a mouse and get cancer, we have very good treatment for you. <laughs> because that's where we've optimized everything for. But even this is not enough. The question is, it's fine if it works, but is it better than something we already have on the market? Because, sorry, coming in number two and asking to charge 10 times as much for something that is not as good as what's already on the market, you're not going to get it approved. You won't be allowed to sell it. And the point is that these things are super expensive. And this entire process can take a decade. And if you are occasionally worried about your performance in classes and everything, uh, farm, trust me, big farm is far worse. The red part here is the fraction that fail. So in the preclinical stage, like roughly two thirds of everything fail during in vitro tests and test tubes and animals. This is awesome. Normally you would think that wouldn't you prefer that to be green? On the contrary, failing here means like you might have a very disappointed student uh, or advisor, but failing here might cost you $10,000. Failing here costs you a billion dollars. <laughs> so if you're a pharma company, you want to fail there. Failing early is failing cheap. The further you go here, the catastrophe is that when you have 500 people working on the project, you've bought the company developing the early drug, you've taken 10 years and you bet the entire market on this, that's where you don't want it to come back and say, sorry, it was not as good as something that's already on the market. That's when companies go bankrupt. And you see this, okay, even in Sweden, you see this occasionally in the stock market where there's a stock that drops 60% because suddenly they came back from a phase two or phase three test and that was negative. So that's a real nightmare. The typical examples, this might take 10 to 15 years. Uh, the problem here is that you only have a patent for 20 years in the Western world. And you need to patent things before it's known so that once you start selling the drug, you only have five years to make back all your costs. This has been extended a bit so that you can, I think you have a five or eight years extension precisely due to this law. But this is, why, sorry, this is why we have to pay as much for drugs as we do. 300 million euros doesn't, well, I was about to say that it doesn't sound so bad. It sounds really bad. Uh, but this is the cost of developing a drug. Then there are plenty of drugs that fail too. So if you're a large company, if you're successful in one case out of three, you're probably very happy. And that one case out of three that is successful will have to recover the cost for the other two cases that were not successful too, and all the cases that failed really early. So that and maybe 150 scientists or so involved. So it's a fairly large, very expensive operation. And the second this comes to market, you only have five, 10 uh, years to bring back all the costs. Yes? So how does it work when there's a thing that the coronavirus? Mm, I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, there are, it's complicated. We started to relax some of the rules, but trust me, you don't want to relax them too much. Uh, I think I have a few slides about it where things can go horribly wrong. Uh, so the research phases that we've got through that we're primarily very early on in the discovery phase or something, then you might be looking at genomes, you look at target validation, you might try to determine structures of them. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about high throughput screening, trying to identify things that bind. Uh, and then eventually we come to leads and then at some point you start going into the clinic. I won't really cover the clinic here anymore, but the point, the earlier you are, the more we are moving towards computers. So 10 years ago, everything was experimental, 15 years ago at least. Today, I would say virtually 90% of the really early phase stuff is computers because it's cheap and we can do it at a much higher throughput than we've ever done before. Um, 
I think this is a good place to take a break. So after the break, I'm going to go through first what we do in these different phases. Uh, we're going to go through some of the challenges, how we can fail. I will. I think I have a few slides of it, but if we don't, I'm going to deliberately going to bring up some of the things to talk about when things can go. It sounds really great that we should be better at imminent threats. That can go horribly wrong in some cases. And then I will talk about coronavirus too, because there's a ton of cool things happening there. Let's meet here at a quarter past. I realize those side effects I'm going to cover in a lecture tomorrow, so you will have to wait 24 hours for that. Um, but to go through this, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the computational tools and the protein structure parts we can need here. Uh, so at some point we need, this could literally be divine inspiration, but we need some sort of molecule to start from. Uh, and they don't really have to be that good, but it has to be better than nothing. There has to be at least a trace of an effect somewhere. And Historically, this would be that something we found in nature, um, and then we try to get rid of side effects and get it better. Today, we typically do what you call high throughput screening, and this is an experimental procedure. So these really fancy robots, um, so that if you have some sort of anything that you can measure, and this could even be measuring current through a channel or something, then these robots can run maybe 100,000 tests a day. So they test 96 uh, wells at a time. Very high throughput. It's they are not cheap. Uh, actually, they are cheap per well. The problem is that you run through quite a few wells per day, right? So that operating these machines can come at a cost of a million and a half Swedish corner per day. So yes, you will have them if you are a pharma company, but the costs run up and they run up fairly quickly. And the problem is 150,000 is nothing compared to the 10 to the power of 60. So that we have to be smart about what we're testing. The other point is that we don't, you can't, Testing it here is cheap, but we don't have 10 to the power of 60 molecules. So we want to start from molecules that already exist. And there are a couple of compound databases. Uh, one is called Zinc, for, stands for Zinc is not commercial. Uh, and that has maybe a few hundred thousand molecules or so that we can order relatively cheaply. And if you're lucky from this, as I mean, it's not that hard to find something that binds. If you're lucky, you get 100 leads here. Um, they might not be great, but it's something to work with. But the problem is that it costs quite a bit. But historically, this is what it always starts with. And in principle, given, compared, to the, uh, compared to the volume of chemical space, it's a laughable probability would, that we would find something good. And in some cases, this is an example that a colleague in Uppsala extracted a few years ago. They were trying to find something that's bound to lactamase. They spent in the ballpark of half a million dollars, and they came out with zero hits. That's not what you want to go into your manager and say that, oh, by the way, Joe, that's that last round that costs us half a million dollars, we don't have anything for it. And then this second case, you were lucky, 146 hits for Kurzweil. The question is, can we do this better in a computer? And I'm going to level with, no, we can't, but we can do it way cheaper in a computer. And those things are a bit coupled. So. What if we could have, there are a couple of tricks here that maybe we can just find some sort of regression. If molecule A works, molecule B might also work. And that relates to something called pharmacophore. And then we're going to talk about not high throughput screening, but virtual screening. So the difference between experimental and computational space is that the computational parts can be super fast. Uh, so we, in an experiment where we might be able to do 300,000 compounds, and the computer might be able to do a billion compounds. Now, the experiment is much more accurate. There is no question about it. But it doesn't help you if you're accurate if I can screen 10,000 times more compounds than you do, right? Because if we don't have to be super accurate. I just need something to start with. And being able to test 10,000 times more things will give you a much greater chance of finding something. So the idea here is not to go for accuracy, but do it sloppy and fast. And there are some simple ways of doing this so that an obvious way is anesthetics. We know that good anesthetics tend to be small and fairly hydrophobic. So if I ask you to find me other molecules that might work as anesthetics, what type of molecules would you look for? Ones that are small and hydrophobic, right? And there are some fancy words for this that you can do this more advanced, of course, and this is called something called QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationships. And that's pretty much just the relation between the 
expected biological activity to simple chemical properties. Hydrophobicity, the number of hydrogen bonds, maybe the charge, the molecular weight, does it have an aromatic ring? And you can encode all these things in long tables so that a computer can understand it. But it's the first experiment is really just fancy linear regression. And a few years ago, this had fallen out of grace a bit because linear regression, that's for, linear regression is for sissies that no real scientist does linear regression. But then you all heard about deep learning, artificial intelligence. And deep learning is really, it's not linear regression, but it's very advanced regression. So this is exploding again now. So what, what everyone does now, if you have 10,000 molecules that you have measured something for, people try to use deep learning. So based on that, can we have the computer predict what will work? And it probably works slightly better than QSAR, but it's not a miracle. Oh, sorry, I had a few examples there, but the whole point, simple things. But you can do it slightly better. If I know my target, if I know the ion channel, I might, I might be able to create a three-dimensional map. I might be able to say that, look, here I really need something that's hydrophobic, hydrophobic, hydrophobic. Here I need a hydrogen bond donor. There I need a hydrogen bond acceptor. And then you can kind of map this out between distances between them in space. Uh, that's a slightly more complicated one call the a pharmacophore, but both of what these both have in common is that they're not trying to solve all the physical problems. They don't go the door in details. They just try to first approximation roughly what type of molecule might fit here. The problem with QSAR though in particular is that advantage is that it's super fast. The disadvantage is that if you make a very specific model here, you will only discover things that are exactly like what you already know. And in the case of anesthetics, some of the best anesthetics today are actually not purely hydrophobic ones. And of course, if you only looked for hydrophobic compounds, you would not find any ones that are not hydrophobic. Uh, large molecules that are flexible, they might occur in different conformations and everything, and that's not really included in this model. So what if it could bind to multiple sites? So QSAR kind of fell out of grace because it was not really advanced enough. So where QSAR only describes the average properties of molecules, these three-dimensional patterns, if you encode that in tables, we end up with something called a pharmacophore. And a pharmacophore essentially just say that you need a hydrogen bond, say, 10 angstroms away from an aromatic ring. That should be 5 angstroms away from another aromatic ring. That should be 10 angstroms away from a, an oxygen. And now I was just inventing things there, right? but some sort of very simple way that you can encode in tables. This does not describe everything about the molecule, mind you, but it encodes some of the three-dimensional properties of the molecule. And once we have this, we can start screening through those gigantic databases. What are all the potential molecules that you could imagine that we produce would fit this? And sometimes this works. You might also be able to find that there are common elements. I already mentioned to you that um, it's very common that you have small and fairly rigid compounds. So all these aromatic rings keep coming back. So this is an example of a whole range of, it's a series of drugs that are kind of similar. And I think you could encode not everything here, but many of the things here would have similar pharmacophores. And exactly how you encode this varies a bit, but it's a very simple way to try to describe overall three-dimensional properties. We might also want to say roughly how much space does this molecule take so that it will fill out the entire binding pocket. And this far I cheated. I haven't spoken anything about protein structure because this is so dirt and simple that you completely ignore the protein. If I have some drug, then I can try to find other things that look like it. And that's very much based on what you asked before, that you start from something that's known. But what if you don't have anything that's known? Well, in some cases, you can start from the protein. Um, and if we have a structure of the protein, we could do what we call molecular docking. So let's say that we have a dopamine receptor or something that if we have something that binds here, we could, in theory, put the molecule here and rather than go the pharmacophore route, try to identify the binding energies here, even with free energy calculation. But free energy calculation would be too expensive. 10 simulations not going to cut it. 10,000 will not cut it. We need to be able to run a billion or 10 billion. And this is fairly easy. You've all done this um, in a slightly easier. Um, the part on the left, we've all done. <laughs> and this is pretty much the same thing, but in the computer. <laughs> that we literally, this has to be so fast that it takes one second 
per molecule we want to test. And then we test, we have a supercomputer and we test 10,000 of them in parallel and we try this like a million times. That gives us 10 billion. So just take a molecule and say, does it fit here? Does it? It's kind of like your average six month old, right? That you try, you try the square one in the round peg and then you try to push harder, but it doesn't work. And eventually you try it in the square hole and then it works. This is exactly the same thing. Take the molecule, does it fit there? Does it fit there? Does it fit there? Does it fit there? No, try next molecule. And when you repeat this 10 billion times, eventually you're successful and find a square peg in a square hole, maybe. But to do this, you need a structure of the protein, at least a homology model, but ideally a crystal structure. And that's why quite a few pharmaceutical companies, they spend millions, if not billions of dollars to determine structures of important targets. And docking in a way, it's very simple that what we need, we need the best way to put two molecules together. So we need the best way and we need some way to saying how good it is. We typically don't use a formal force field here because that would be too expensive. So I need a very cheap way to say, was this good or bad? And then I need a way to, ways to put two molecules together that if they can be in multiple orientations or something, you need some sort of way of sampling and testing things. So we need to search. So we need a very simple, fast way to say whether a particular test is good or bad, and I need a very fast way of searching. And in principle, your guess is almost as good as mine here, but you need an obvious way to sampling is that you might take a small molecule and just try to randomly rotate it. Uh, so you have the entire molecule first, and then we might have a few bonds inside the molecule that can rotate, and then I need to try to rotate those bonds too. And again, if I'm lucky, I might be able to do this so that it takes a second or a few seconds per molecule. And divine inspiration is perfectly fine here. I don't care if I miss something good. That happens. Because that if you, again, if you look at LUSIC, you don't need to find the world's best molecule to inhibit a proton pump. All you need to find is a good one. So we, of course, I would, it's a bummer if I miss something really good. I would prefer that I don't do it, but it's more important that I find something. And that's why speed is everything in docking. So that all the beautiful things in physics we throw out the window here, it just has to be super fast. Uh, but if we were to do this exhaustively for every single uh, patch on the surface and it would take 200 years, we can't do that. So then you end up with some sort of algorithm that we, we occasionally call them genetic algorithms, but the only part that's genetic here is basically we try to have the algorithm learn so that we make an initial population randomly that we might try to place it randomly and then we over the surface and then we realize, look, in these two or three patches, we tend to have fairly good energies and that means focus your attention there. Same thing with the molecules. If you test uh, tons of different classes of molecules, but we realize in general, the hydrophobic ones tend to do better. Focus your attention on the hydrophobic ones. So we try to have some sort of self-learning step just as evolution is self-learning here, right? And again, this will mean that we miss some things, but it's better to find something than waiting 200 years before we get the best possible answer. And then we just, well, whether we call it mutate, but we have to some sort of change something semi-randomly and then repeat, repeat, repeat. There are other ways to do this that you don't necessarily need to start from a full molecule. You can do what you call fragment-based drug design so that I can, if I have a small library of multiple fragments, I can try to start from my pocket and then I try to build different fragments in different parts of the pocket. And then when I find a bunch of good fragments, then we ask an organic chemist, so could you stitch these fragments together to one molecule? And in this case, at first date, the organic chemist is a computer too. So we ask the computer, can you stitch this together into one molecule? So then we gradually build up the molecule in the binding site and that also frequently works well. And then to combine that, we need some sort of ways to very rapidly say which one is good or bad. You could use one of these MD force fields, but that's too slow. We don't have water here. So in general, we tend to have something that is very ad hoc. We say that hydrogen bonds are good. If it's hydrophobic atoms matching hydrophobic atoms, that's good. If it's a positive charge matching a negative charge, that's good. And vice versa when things are bad. And there are, a few, there are a few different forms of doing this. You can also make some sort of statistical potentials based on how likely is it for pairs of atoms to be close to each other. And we're well aware that this is sloppy, but it has to be fast, fast, fast. And then to make this even faster, we don't try every single position, but actually it might be easy to show you this way. We might take some sort of molecule, 
I might evaluate properties on each grid cell, saying that that particular point for this protein tends to be hydrophobic. That is hydrophilic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophobic, charged. And if you do this, then I can just take my small molecule and test this against the grid. It's horribly sloppy. It's that the things that would make you tear your hair, right? But it's fast, fast, fast. And if we find something that's slightly good, then we can decide to take a step back and do it much more accurate. So it's, you, only, you can do anything you want, but it can take more than one second per molecule you can test. And the point is that um, this kind of works. So this is the same example used before. Lactamase, you spent, three, you spent half a million dollars, zero experimentalists, but they found two docking hits. The computer time here probably cost you $1,000. And I'm not sure about you, but if I were the chief financial officer in this com the company, half a million dollars versus $1,000. $1,000 is a hell of a lot nicer. Here, the docking was not at all as good as the experimental one. Uh, on the other, we don't know how good, what if the best possible hit was one of those five? Then we're happy, right? The, we don't necessarily need 146. So what we typically do here is that you start out in the computer, based on, then we take those five hits into the lab and see, are any of these interesting? If two of those are interesting, then okay, let's come up with more molecules that were similar to the two interesting ones, and then repeat this again in the computer. So that this, the point is not that the computer is replacing the lab, but you iterate between the computer and the lab and use the lab to check where the computational prediction is good. And as you get slightly further, you can allow even the protein to be flexible so that the side chains of the proteins can move. Um, the cost of that, well, the advantage is that you will get a better prediction. The problem is that now it will be 10 to 100 times more expensive. So suddenly you can't, you might be able to test 100 million compounds rather than 10 billion. So this is a trade-off that you would like the accuracy, but it's more important to find something. Yes? Uh, you mean try the experimental hits in the computation? Uh, yeah, so you invert the docking Yes. So normally we start in the computer because it's a hundred times more cheaper, right? And, and the idea, normally you would not like five. You might, testing 50 or so works fine. Uh, and then we want to try those 50 based on that most pharma companies, they work in a flow that takes roughly four to six weeks. So that during those four weeks, based on where the structure is now, you need to come back with me within two weeks, and that's like 10 working days, give me a list of 10 things we should test in the next experimental round. So that you can do anything you want in the computer lab, but it can't take more than 10 days. I'm completely uninterested what you could do in three weeks. So in 10 days, I need to know what we should test in the next round, and then we do a new experimental screen. It might be 100 compounds. Based on the outcome of that, that you will know another week later. Based on the outcome of that, you can go back into the computer room and decide what would you like to do now, because now I want 10 better things to try. And then you keep iterating this way year after year after year to improve it. At this point, you might have a drug, because you actually have something that it binds, and it binds, and we know that it binds, and it has hopefully been confirmed experimentally that it binds to the right receptor. This will work, and it might even inhibit the receptor if you're fine with eating five kilos of medicine per day with lots of side effects and not very strong. Right? Because the problem is not going to be very efficient at binding. And that has to do with the equilibrium constant. If it's not a very efficient binder and you want this to bind to every single cell in your body, you need a very high concentration in your blood, say one molar or something. Trust me, at one molar, it doesn't matter what molecule you're adding, you're going to have so many side effects that that would never be approved. So we now need to improve the binding to get it to be very, very efficient at binding so that you can take a small pill. And the way this works is that you go into the computer and iterate this, and then you say, try to, you might create a pharmacophore, you might try to, ident this is a pharmacophore, then identify something that's similar. Uh, in this case, they end up with a symmetric diol, um, and then uh, you find a database hit. This was the initial design, there's phosphate groups down there. This was, uh, they extended to make the diol again, and then they added urea groups, and then they optimized the stereochemistry to bind in the particular receptor step. This was the final drug that was then selected for phase one trial. And this is a super famous molecule because it's the HIV-1 protease inhibitor. It was the first drug 
to actually have an effect in AIDS treatment, and it was the first drug that on the preclinical stage was designed computationally. So this is a drug, it was not based on anything in the Amazonas or anything. It was designed from scratch to target one receptor with computers. This is another cool drug, atrovastatin, Lipeter. Do you know what you're looking at? You're a bit too young to eat Lipeter. It basically lowers cholesterol. You're looking at $14 billion per year of sales. This is the, probably the largest drug success ever in the world. Until 2015, it made $140 billion. And these are the annual sales revenue. And then something happened. What happened in 2012? No, 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 that uh, high cholesterol, they, the drug is still, it's, it's a great drug. They ran out of their patent. So at this point, there was generics. So then anybody could copy the drug. And then people started producing it much cheaper. And this is the point here, I, I'm not, again, Pfizer, they have, uh, they certainly made a ton of money here. But of course, all these absurdly high revenues, they paid, had to pay for lots of other failures and lots of marketing and everything. Uh, but you, all, you have a relatively few years where you're making all the money off the drug. And today, of course, they hardly make any money at all from Lipeter anymore. So drugs have a very short commercial life. Now, of course, in the, sci the scientific life, it's great. Uh, the drug still works. So one question is, you started to use molecular simulation. Historically, we have not used molecular simulation for drug discovery, mainly because it's been too expensive. It's been unclear how accurate they were. And in particular, the free energy calculation methods have not been good enough. This is gradually changing. The last few years, there are some beautiful examples where MD simulations can predict free energy calculations very accurately. Um, and I think we are some examples from David Shaw, actually. Oh, this, yes, this is a brute force sampling of a small drug binding to a large protein. And you will see that eventually this one will sneak into the binding pocket there in the middle. Yes, I think there you have it. And the cool thing is that when they determined the X-ray structure of this, the ligand was exactly in that place. And this is by no means cheap. They're, they're designing this hardware and they're selling them for millions of dollars. But some of the first GPCR experimental structures that were determined are rumored to have been investments, so commercial investments of $2 billion to determine one structure. And compared to $2 billion, any computing time, you can, any computer you can imagine is going to be insanely cheap compared to taking 10 years and $2 billion. We can learn quite a lot. The other thing that simulations can do, they can occasionally tell you exactly First, where is the ligand binding? What is the interaction energy? Uh, occasionally, can tell you how the activation process happens to. But you see here, the orange is the one predicting the simulation. The black is the one determining the extra crystal structure. It's scarily good. So the computer, we are able to do chemistry entirely in computers today without determining the co-crystal structure. The other thing that the simulations can tell you that you've kind of looked at this already that in some cases that how long does it take for this ligand to bind? Is there, does the process have to go under through some sort of activation? Historically, it's not something we've looked at. But in some cases, it's not just important that it binds, but the question, what is it doing once it has bound? How is it changing the receptor's role and what is the time constants here? So this is, until five years ago, I would say that this is something that could be interesting for the future. That's no longer the case. This is increasingly used at least to understand flexibility and where things bind for drug design. And that brings us to the last 10 or 12 slides here, um, that there is some, I'm not sure whether cool is the right word, but we're fortunate or uh, fascinated to be the part where we have all this coronavirus stuff, because this is happening as we speak right now. It's a remarkable insight this is completely different from how traditional drug design has worked. Uh, I think it's a sign for the future. Uh, I have no idea whether it's going to be successful or not, um, but this is going an order of magnitude faster than I've ever seen anything in drug design before. And that's what makes it a bit exciting. And it's also much more computational. Uh, so previous in the class, last time I broke up, I called this uh, NCOV 2019. Uh, the name was formally changed to 2019 COVID. Uh, so this is the coronavirus that uh, appeared around the, the turn of the year in China. 
you can actually have a look at some of these Innofor, which is an Austrian company involved in drug design. They are updating this website pretty much day by day. So you can track it in real time how things are going so that I've stolen some of the slides from their, uh, their page. Um, and the first thing you do, if you don't know anything, a virus genome is fairly short. I had the coronavirus genome on a slide earlier in the class. And the first thing you do is that you put that in the database and use bioinformatics tools and identify, do we know anything about this? And in some cases you can find sequence patterns. And in this case, we're even happier because it turns out that some of the proteins encoded for by this virus, we actually know the structure of. So this is a protease kind of like the HIV-1 protease. And the cool thing, we have some like 98% sequence identity to a protease with known structure. And if I recall correctly, that's from the MERS virus, which is not entirely surprising. That's another type of coronavirus. If you have 98% sequence identity, is that good or bad? At 98% sequence identity, I would eat my left shoe if the structures are not the same. Like it's so good that you may, we know what this protein structure looks like. The computer can get this. You don't need to determine it. So it's great. We know what at least, this is not the only protein in the, uh, in the coronavirus, uh, but it's a very important one. And again, in HIV, for instance, we have drugs against HIV-1 protease. So this might be an interesting target. If we could destroy the function of the virus's protease, that's a potential drug that we could use. So just based on this sequence, in an hour you can create an homology model of the protein. And they, they've gone through that, they've done some molecular models, they've, they even did some simulations and energy minimization, which I'm not sure how important it was. Uh, but based on this, you can also, you can learn a bit about the structure, and in this particular case, you see that the, the confidence in the structure prediction is 100%, so that 300 residues cover. There are 2% of my sequence that are not in the previous PDB structure, and that's fine. That it's either it's a very small loop, or it's the very first or last parts of the sequence. Don't worry about those 2%. We're this is gonna be awesome, and you can even bring that. If you go to the web page, I think you can bring that up and click on it and rotate it to see what it looks like. Uh, you can also, even when you've let the computer optimize this, just to show you, when you create a homology model, how similar it is between these two viruses. Now, mind you, this is a model, uh, but let's see here. I never remember which one is which, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but so that the actual PDB file might be the green and this model is the blue one. But the point is that they are so similar that they are virtually identical. There are a handful of side chains that might vary a little bit. The only problem though is that if those side chains are in the parts in the binding pockets and everything, that will change the things they bind. And if one amino acid is sufficient to make the virus, uh, make the protein behave in a different way. Yes, do you have a question or? Okay, oh, sorry, so somebody waving. So the next thing we need to do is we need to identify what are the pockets here. Um, in theory, you could start to dock away right away and try to find something, but that's a bit stupid. That it's unlikely that you will bind here. If there is an important pocket here that's important for the protein's role, it's likely a bit buried and everything like the pockets we saw. So an obvious way to do this is that let's just try to find holes in the protein first. And there are some fairly easy ways to identify cavities. So they found one cavity down there, just with these point clouds, and another cavity down there, up here. In this particular case, this company, they have their own algorithm that uh, they call, what did they call that? I should know, it says it's somewhere. It's a Catalo 4 uh, model, which is the service they are selling, but it's basically a Pharmaco 4 like model. So that for each of these pockets, they now have a recipe here. So what are the types of structures that might fit in these pockets? And then they're screening through very large databases to find are there potentially interesting things here that could bind in this pocket now for the new model that has all the side chains of the coronavirus structure. And at this point, this probably took them three, four days because you need to create a homology model. You need to make test a few different models, make sure that Make sure that you're happy with the structures, make sure that you're happy with the cavities, maybe try out a few different cavities so that you don't make mistakes, but it's a relatively fast and not too computationally expensive. But at this point, now you wanna start screening through millions of different compounds. So then they used time, I think it was in a cluster on Amazon or something, uh, and used 23 years of CPU time uh, in 24 hours. So that use a gigantic large external resource, and the more time you have, the larger a database you can screen through. 
And once they screened through that database, they came up with a short list of roughly 10 compounds, I think, but I think they only showed the first 10 ones. So their argument was that anything below 0 0.1 in their algorithm is a completely arbitrary score where low is good. Uh, should be an interesting target. So then they had a short list of 10 compounds that could be interesting to try. And they haven't, again, this was like two weeks ago, so they haven't had a chance to try all these things. First, I'm not even sure whether all these are available synthesized because it's one thing to knowing that that particular molecule would be good. The question is, can you order that molecule on the internet? Otherwise, you're gonna need to hire an organic chemist and show him the formula and say, can you come up with a way to make this molecule? And then the organic chemist will scratch their head and say, give me a few days and I'll come back. And then they, they need to invent a new th synthesis process to create that particular molecule. And depending on how complicated that molecule is, that can be a very complicated, expensive, and difficult process. I think I've heard in general, if you ask, if you outsource the production of a new molecule to Asia or so, uh, expect to pay between ten and fifty thousand dollars if it's a molecule that has never been synthesized before. That's perfectly fine if it's one molecule you want to test for a coronavirus. If you're working in this company, though, you likely don't want to go to your boss and tell him, "I would like to synthesize one thousand such molecules because that's fifty million dollars just for this week." Uh, well, you can. If you're lucky, they're going to be very happy, or you will be out of a job next week. <laughs> but then, of course, everyone tends to rewrite history a little bit, so that there were tons of things going on in parallel. So that in parallel, Chinese scientists that were testing things, and I'm, it's a bit unclear how they tested it. But a molecule that several teams became interested in in parallel was called uh, lopinavir. And lopinavir was actually part of their top 10 or 20 compounds, and it had a score of roughly 0.08, so be below their 0.1 threshold. Uh, and lopinavir is a drug that is actually used clinically to treat HIV. This is a huge advantage. Why? It's already synthesized, and that means you can buy it. That's certainly one advantage. There's a greater advantage. I'm not so worried about the $50,000 now. <laughs> exactly, right? So that certainly, there could certainly be side effects to this one, but it's something that has been tested. It has gone through phase one, phase two, and phase three. It might not work so that, in principle, we believe very strongly that we need to stick to science. We can't guess. And that's important, that's super important in general in drug design because that's, you might think that that's stupid. Why shouldn't we guess sometimes if it's important and can save lives? That the problem is that hundreds of years of modern medicine, the entire success of modern medicine, we know what we're doing. We're not doing things randomly. We're basing it on science and we're giving a drug because we actually have a clear hypothesis why it's working. And sure, for one patient, you could argue it's no big deal if we just try something, right? But if we start to throw out this whole basing it on science, which we will just try anything, before we know it, well, you, all, you might have seen the scandal around Macharini in Sweden, right? That's what happened when we start throwing science out there. We will just try anything that might work. So scientists and drug, we are very hesitant to try things that are not been proven to work. But then there are exceptions. And in particular, when it's a pandemic or something, we might make an exception you will not get an exception to start randomly giving a patient one of the molecules in the previous top five. We have no idea whether that will kill the patient, and that's deeply unethical, because the likelihood of dying from coronavirus is at worst 2%. Random molecule that you're injecting, it could be a 50% risk of dying, so we can't do that. But a medicine that we know is safe, at least at low doses, so this is called repurposing, and it's starting to become very important, because it's great. We have something that's safe and we know Maybe we could take this medicine and use it for something else too. And there's a quite fun fact that when it comes to patents, so you might own a patent for lopinavir when it comes to using lopinavir to treat HIV. So you're making tons of money for HIV. But I, if I discover this, I might be able to get a patent for using lopinavir for treating this molecule. So you are now not allowed to use lopinavir to treat coronavirus without paying me. Now, on the other hand, you own the patent to the molecules. I can't produce this molecule without paying you. So then we need to sit down and talk. <laughs> Maybe form a joint company, right? Um, so that, is this horrible? Well, in a way it is horrible, but, but the point is, yeah, sorry. Okay. 
Sure, uh, but remember that when it comes to the phase one, the phase one testing is that we test it on healthy subjects, right? Uh, that's, so you usually take some people who would do anything for money, like students, uh, and then you give them $50 and they think they're making $50. What you're, I'm not kidding. You're literally giving students chemicals that have never been tested on a human before, but they have been tested on mice. Um, and then the students take $50 and are very happy because they have something to eat that week. So that we have tested them on healthy humans. Um, and at some point, yes, there is still a risk, but at some point, if we start, if we start feeling that this risk is significantly lower than one, smaller than 1%, with the risk of dying from the virus is 2%, at some point, the benefit outweighs the risk, and it might be worth testing this for coronavirus. The other point is that we're not doing this randomly. I'm not randomly giving you any drug, right? This is a virus where we know that this drug influences and binds to the HIV protease inhibitor. This is also a protease inhibitor. It's a very similar protease inhibitor, and I now have a hypothesis that this will be able to bind this particular inhibitor too. So this is based, I'm relaxing the trials a bit, but it's still based on science. It's not random. We don't know this work yet, that there have been some indications that some of the patients are getting better from this. The danger here, though, is that there are so many rumors floating around, and of course, some patients will get better. It's not necessarily, it might just be that they got good treatment in general. And this is the problem, that we need those tests to make sure that statistically that things work. In a crisis, we will relax that a little bit, but long term, it's very dangerous to start giving up the test and just shooting for the best and hoping. Having said that, um, so what, what this Inno4 company then did, they now refocused roughly a week ago on uh, lopinavir. So then they used MD simulations, just like the ones you were doing two weeks ago, and they found a bunch of different bound conformations in the pocket. So these are snapshots of lopinavir bound with slightly different conformations for the lopinavir molecule in this particular pocket. I think, yes, I managed to get a small movie from them. So this is a super, uh, like two weeks ago or so, like three weeks ago. So this is a super short simulation, only 300 picoseconds, not much longer than the ones you did. And I think you will, yes, that's one example of the molecule bound, and let's see if, I think, yes, I think there you will see it moving. It's not really moving a lot here. They are not using MD simulations to actually calculate free energies or anything, but they're somehow using it to realize the molecule might actually be stable there. It appears to stay bound there. So at least it's the first reasonable shot to hope that it might stay put, stay put there. In a crisis, maybe good enough. Give this a few years. In the future, I think you would do a proper free energy calculation, as Bert talked about, and say specifically how well does it bind there. Today, that would be a bit expensive. Give this another five years or so, it will take an hour. Because it's as frustrated as we are and as slow as computers sometimes feel, computers get roughly twice as fast every year, right? We don't have any near, anywhere near that development in experiments. Experiments might be twice as good today as they were 10 years ago. So in, and that's why we're increasingly seeing this shift. There is more and more and more we can do in computers, and it's cheaper all the time. Uh, in parallel to that, there is one more thing. Uh, um, the cool thing here is that, in general, we need structures of proteins, too. So that I, we hinted a little bit about cryo-EM, but since, since I spoke last week, there have been a joint US and Chinese team that were able to purify one of the spike proteins, which is another protein in the coronavirus, in 12 days. So that they managed to identify the gene, they were overexpressing the protein, they were purifying the protein, they put this in cryo-EM grids, they were able to record this, they were able to determine the structure, they were able to refine the structure, they were able to write up the manuscript, they were able to submit the manuscript to a pre in 12 days. Four days later, this was published in Science. So the total of from the, from the point they started the work until this was published in Science was 16 days. I've never seen anything like it. Like, historically, this would take two years. So if there's a, I'm in shock and awe. At, I think this is science to come for science in the future, that China is becoming a world power in science. They're insanely good. On the one hand, on the other part, the part of it, these are also US teams involved. So it has become a worldwide effort and it's kind of amazing how much everyone is sharing, everyone is sharing all the information all the time. I have no idea whether we're gonna have new vaccines for the coronavirus, uh, but it, it's a very interesting development for the future. And I think even at Scilab Lab, we're talking that in Sweden, we need to set up some sort of a rapid response task forces. So when things like this appear, we should instantly be able to push the button and have a team of people start working on it. Uh, so we're not there yet. I think this was published February 19th. 
So we're not there yet, but I think give this a few years, it's not gonna be a matter of a decade to develop new drugs, as now, but in some cases we will be able to do it in months. Now that brings, of course, other, um, talking about all the collaborations is fancy, right? But uh, those $140 billion that Pfizer made from repeater, so that's mostly rich, rich fat people in the Western world, that's, that's your ideal. If you want to design drugs and make money, that's the type of patients you want. So make a super expensive drug, sell it to people with lots of money, uh, make sure that it's a drug they have to take the rest of their lives. Uh, so that you should not, act. the worst drug they have is a drug that just cures the disease because you will only sell them one dose. That, but if they have to keep taking this anti-cholesterol thing the rest of their life, that's possible. Um, now, of course, I, I'm joking a bit, right? That these drug companies are not necessarily God's best children in the sense that they're, they're not out there to make a benefit to society. And it's very easy to argue that they make too much money, we should tax them and everything. Uh, I think most of these companies spend more money on PR than they do on basic research. They prefer that the university does the basic research. And that's typically the sentiment we normally have. We like to paint them in a bad picture. On the other hand, if we compare, let's pick AstraZeneca, a Swedish, well, it's half Swedish company. Is AstraZeneca a bad company? It's easy to argue that based on how much money they make. But if you compare that, say, to Bofors, they're selling weapons. <laughs> and everything is relative, right? That compared to, and, and again, these are scientists. Uh, they are people working with management and everything. They're, they're professionals that they need to make a salary. They need to pay their mortgages on their house. In the grand scheme of things, making money from curing ill people, I find it difficult to fault that compared to, say, making money from selling weapons. Uh, and that's where things get a little bit more complicated. So the reason why this entire process is very expensive is that we don't, accept, we don't accept side effects. We only give them a relatively short patent protection. We want the new drugs. We typically don't pay for them ourselves, so that, but we just expect the drugs to be there, right? But I don't think it's quite as clear cut as you occasionally make it uh, in the news. There are certainly some really horrible drug companies out there that just buy, buy up old medicines and then they stop producing them and try to increase the prices, but those are the exceptions rather than the norm. Uh, so some of these companies invest quite a lot in, uh, not only do they invest quite a lot, but they're actually able to cure diseases that we couldn't cure a few decades ago. Leukemia is a great example of that. Um, a genera well, maybe two generations ago, in the 70s, the death rate among child, uh, for childhood leukemia was pretty much 90%. That virtually all children that got leukemia died. And today it's pretty much the opposite. We cure 80% of kids that get leukemia. And that's not better treatment. That's because we have drugs and tons of, well, decades of research effort have gotten into it. I think that's also the last real slide I had. So for once I'm gonna finish the time. Um, the study questions are intentionally a bit broader. I will talk a little bit about this tomorrow. That, but I would like to, Let's try to split this about in a few challenges. So first, what are the fundamental scientific challenges to drug design? And that has to do with this thing that you need to find agonists, inverse agonists, antagonists, etc. You really need to influence something biologically. Then there are a bunch of technical challenges. How do you achieve this? How do you achieve it cheaply enough, right? That I'm not interested in what you can do for a billion dollars because you're working for my company that has a turnover of $10 million. So you need to be realistic. Then there are a bunch of practical treatment challenges that you can't have side effects. You need small doses of protein. People don't want to take an injection. Uh, and related to that, you have all these financial challenges. You, if you want 200, 150 scientists abroad, you need to be able to pay them. You need to pay the students if you're doing clinical tests. And then I touched a little bit about how the fact we can use free and is uh, try to think a bit forward looking here. That's many of the methods we've gone through in this class because that's very much the future of the drug design. Yes. Or the same company. Yeah, or the same company. <laughs> uh, so this has to do with patent legislation in general. It's complicated. That a patent is ultimately not the right to make money. A patent is a way for me to forbid you from doing something. The reason why the society gives me a patent, that might sound stupid, uh, 
but in return for getting a patent, I have to make my invention public. So that after those 20 years, everyone will be able to copy it. Otherwise, you could imagine me starting a private clinic where you would come and I would give you the medicine in my clinic, but you could never take the medicine out of my clinic to make sure that it stays secret. And that would be a business secret instead. So that, of course, if I am now, and this has happened, Losig is a perfect example, so that roughly 10 years after the first generation, they came up with a second generation of Losig that was more efficient. They pretty much just cut the molecule in half. I bet they found that out earlier than after 10 years. So yet you improve it a bit. And then, sure, the original version of the molecule, that is now public and can be sold by anybody. But the new, more efficient one that's more effective, and that where you don't need as large a dose and where you have fewer side effects, that I still have a patent on. And if you look at that, I'm not sure whether that happened to Lipeter, but that's frequently that the revenue does not go down to zero when you lose the patent. So, of course, when the first generation of the drug can be sold, particularly developing countries, everyone where the cost is really a matter, they will start to use the copy. But the richer world, they might actually prefer to pay you a bit of money for the slightly better version you have now. The other thing is this repurposing. Uh, again, if I can take your drug and come up with a new way of using it, I can patent the new part. Uh, but maybe there can be, you might also be able to come up with a way of using a third molecule to do the same thing. Um, so that the problem is that it's going to, it's harder and harder to make as much money eventually. Yes, and it's also, it can't be, the requirement for getting a patent is that it can't be obvious. Uh, so it has to, you have to combine at least two things in a way that is not obvious to somebody skilled in the field. So if it was just a matter of adding one hydrogen bond, then do that was completely obvious. Anybody who looked at this would have guessed, oh, no, you won't, then you won't get a patent in theory. In practice, you occasionally get it anyway. It's 3 p.m. We will meet tomorrow too. Tomorrow I'm gonna go through the real science fiction future when we try to design proteins, because these are small drugs. Tomorrow I'm gonna to talk about making protein drugs. Uh, and then you really need to understand folding. And then I'm also gonna go through some of these things where it can go horribly wrong, uh, because it has gone horribly wrong a couple of times recently. And then the second half tomorrow, I think I'm gonna have a Q&A session for anything you might wanna ask ahead of the exam or so. But since you have two weeks or so until the exam, I'll also make sure, I'll schedule at least something online where you have a chance to ask questions in the last minute.